All right, well, we're going to be uh, kind of doing a part two. Most of the ones moving forward will we'll probably be in a kind of a part two, part one. We've, uh, we're kind of, we want to go back through uh, subjects and uh, cover them more in more depth and uh, as we uh, kind of move forward. And so this kind of kind of be the plan. Last uh, month, we uh, we looked at worldviews in conflict, a uh, uh, talk titled this, wherein I, <clears throat> I tried to argue I tried to uh, paint the picture, if you will, of why the U.S. is losing its, uh, if you will, its, uh, its commitment to the Lord. And I, I thought the base, best place to uh, illustrate this was to kind of was to first start talking about the tremendous Christian heritage that we uh, that we were so fortunate to receive. Our country is was founded on a firm Christian heritage, and you can see this anywhere you look, from our money to our to our monuments in Washington D.C. We look to. Uh, I looked at some of these statistics. For example, 27 of 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence uh, had Christian seminary degrees. Um, we also found that 95% uh, of the founding fathers of the U.S. were devoutly Christians. 100% had known Christian uh, church affiliations. In addition, 106 of the first 108 schools were founded by Christians. We have a, we were fortunate to receive a country with a tremendous Christian heritage. And we can see this in our declarations of, uh, uh, for, for example, uh, Thanksgiving uh, Day declarations that, that show that our, our country from its very beginning was devoutly de devoted to uh, uh, God. And, and it's, it's, we're, we see this from, from our congressional proclamations to our presidential proclamations, but we're seeing that all over the world we're seeing a decline in church attendance. Um, over in the UK, we're seeing churches closed at a phenomenal rate, and the government at this point trying to figure out what to do with all of these tremendous buildings. We look to uh, statistics. So we uh, we saw some uh, early uh, work from uh, James Luba, who did a, a survey of a U.S. scientists and found that the number of scientists in the U.S. had fallen dramatically over the years where he was he was doing his his uh, uh, work. But we saw Edward Larson repeated Luba's survey and found that amongst top natural scientists, he said disbelief is greater than ever, almost total. And this statement was related to the members of the National Academies of Science, which advises, amongst other things, our policymakers about how science should be taught in our public schools. We looked uh, at uh, a number of uh, examples of religious discrimination that we're seeing. We're seeing our, our monuments, for example, of our, t our Ten Commandments monuments being torn down across the nation as, uh, as uh, atheist and uh, um, as civil liberties groups are attacking these uh, these uh, these important monuments we're even seeing our, our monuments in Washington DC uh, being uh, uh altered in ways that deny our Christian heritage. For example, the, the Washington Monument that had a capstone that was labeled with the, the phrase, Lousdale, praise be to God, has been hidden from observers. People that go to Washington Monument today don't even know that it was adorned with such expressions. We've seen how important uh, scientists such as Richard Sternberg from the from the Smithsonian Institute, or Guillermo Gonzalez from Iowa State University, or uh, David Coppedge, who was the team leader on the Cassini missions at Saturn. All of these scientists lost their jobs when uh, simply uh, for simply believing in intelligent design or espousing those views amongst their coworkers. Or even people have lost uh, or were overlooked from from uh, Nobel prizes such as Raymond Damadian. Why is it that we're seeing such discriminations against people of faith in this country? We also look to, uh, and the reason why this is in particularly troubling, uh, what we're, what's happening in our country, is because of the impact that this is having on young people. And this is where our greatest concern lies. For me in particular, I mean, I do lots and lots of, uh, lots of teaching, and, and I'm fortunate to be able to teach at a Christian school where I'm able to teach to middle school and high school students on a regular basis about, uh, about God's creation and, and about um, the, the, this wonderful world that he's made for us. But it is a sad thing to me that I'm giving so few opportunities otherwise. Meaning, I mean, I'm open to uh, teachings uh, to young people anywhere I have opportunity, but I, ha I get almost no invitations to do so. Even though I teach at a Christian school, my specialization is middle school, high school students, yet I, I'm invited almost, uh, I'm very rarely to teach at youth groups 
which is and children's ministries, where I think is where the need really lies. Teaching a bunch of adults is great because we want to teach the teachers. But how much of that knowledge for, that you give to teachers, people such as yourself, are passed down to the young people? I oftentimes I look around in groups and I'm like, where's the youth? Where are the kids? You know, and particularly the programs I do on a regular basis are attended almost entirely by, by adults. But it's the kids that we really need to reach. We are seeing a, a terrible, terrible decline in faith amongst young people. Again, as a predictor of where the nation is heading in this regard, We'll look at one of our kind of a, a, one of our parent countries, if we will, the UK again. In this case, in Australia, a, uh, t- a survey in Australia found that church involvement had declined dramatically in the last 50 years, while at the same time, property cl- uh, crime and, and youth suicide increased. A connection between these two, I think, is begged. We looked previously at a, at a Gallup poll that showed that the, that the percentage of people in the U.S. that believe in God is tremendously high. 92% of the population uh, today believes in God, a statistic that has remained stable all the way since the 1940s, where, where Gallup first started doing this poll. Literally, 94% was the uh, result of the, of the survey back in, back in, 1940, in the 1940s. Today, it's, ni- it's 92% of the population believe in God. But when you look at the demographic, Amongst, amongst the age groups, you see that the picture is not so sunny, and it's particularly amongst the young people. The reason why it's 92% instead of 94% is because there's a, a 10% lower rate of belief amongst our 20-year-olds. This is, this is the most uh, troubling part of this, and we're also seeing a markedly lower rate of belief amongst people with education, and particularly higher education. This Barna survey fi- found similar concerns. They found that uh, 61% of today's young adults who are, were regular church attendees are spiritually disengaged in their 20s. They found 20% of those who are spiritually active during high school maintain a similar level of commitment in their 20s, or that only 6% of people in their 20s and 30s today can be considered what we call evangelical. This is troubling. What's happening that's uh, causing this? Well, in 2009, the American Research Group interviewed a thousand individuals who used to attend church regularly but no longer do. So this was a group of 20-year-olds who were regular church attendees when they were in elementary, middle school, or high school who had walked away from the church and were no longer attending church regularly in their 20s. And they asked them a series of 78 questions to try to characterize what the contributing factors were to the they're walking away from the church. And we're going to look at some more of this survey later. But, but what was most troubling about this is how soon the walking away from the faith seems to start. I had seen a lot of these statistics over the years um, of how uh, 20-year-olds, how there's a markedly lower rate of belief amongst 20-year-olds. And I regarded my, my work at the high school level to be kind of preparing them for college when they, at that point, would start losing their faith. But what this survey showed was that the walking away from the church or walking away from their faith or belief in, belief in the Bible started much sooner than, tw- than uh, in, 20s, in their 20s. Forty percent of the people in this survey... Had left their had left had already started questioning the Bible's contents in high school. A full ninety percent say they began doubting the Bible's contents before college. So ninety percent of this group of twenty year olds who had walked away from the church said they were doubting the Bible before college. If we don't reach them when they're in high school, if we don't reach them before high school, then we've already lost about half of them. When this group was asked, at what age did you begin to really question the contents? Again, almost 75% of the kids that left the church were questioning the contents of the Bible during middle school and high school. 30% said during middle school. So it's a lot, it's a lot sooner than college. It's in middle school that we really need to be reaching these kids. Those who no longer, of those, the, those that no longer believe that all the accounts of the, and stories in the Bible are true were asked, when did you first have doubts? Again, 83.45 said they no longer believe, uh, those, of those that no longer believe said they first had doubts in, uh, in middle school and high school. Only 10% first had doubts in college. We're losing them. We're losing them uh, at a very early age. Perhaps, though, the most disturbing revelation of this survey was that uh, um, more of, of this group that had walked away from the church had attended Sunday school than did not. 60% of this group of 20-year-olds had attended Sunday schools 
Only 40% did not. And when asked, do you believe of, so of those that attended Sunday schools versus not had some questions that they had to ask uh, or respond to, do you believe that God used evolution to create human beings? 24% of those who had attended Sunday school said yes to this question. Only 18% who did not. Do you believe that God used evolution to change one kind of animal to another? Again, a higher, much higher percentage of those who had attended Sunday school said yes to this question. They did not. So, I mean, what are we teaching them in Sunday school? You know, we definitely seem to be teaching the wrong stuff. And sadly, in most churches today, I, they are teaching some brand of theistic evolution. They teach that you can believe in God and still believe in evolution. This is what we're teaching in our churches today. So what's this? the most common thing that is taught uh, to our young people today is a some brand of theistic evolution. Jesus said in John, I, he says, I've spoken of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe I speak of heavenly things? This is a response to Nicodemus. The point I'm making with this is, I mean, if we can't trust what the Bible says on earthly matters, on historical matters, like the creation or the global flood or all of the, the many miracles that took place in the Old Testament, how can we believe the miracles in the New Testament or the testimonies in the New Testament? If we can't believe what it says about historical matters, how can we believe what it says about spiritual matters like salvation? You can't. That's why we, it's a critically important that we be able to defend the historical content of the Bible, like as we've been covering. Well, to stem the tide of the loss of faith taking place today amongst young people, it is important that we be prepared to answer the challenges that other worldviews bring. The goal of apologetics in particular is specifically to address the false teachings of this world that are leading to a loss of faith and to show how the same scientific findings that are being used to challenge the biblical history can be interpreted differently and in fact in support of the biblical creation or the biblical timeline. <laughs> But we are truly in a, a nation in crisis. We're finding our nation just in a true state of, of crisis today. And we, we need to address these false teachings that are causing it, that are causing us to lose our faith. It is the false teachings of this world that are responsible. In April 2009, a, a Newsweek, <coughs> Newsweek declared on the cover of its magazine the decline and fall of Christian America. Who would ever thought this would happen? We would be seeing publications such as this. Do we really understand the times? The feature article in this uh, issue was titled The End of Christian America. And it summarizes the results from a 2009 Newsweek survey in which the author states the following about this survey. He said the percentage of self-identified Christians has fallen, fallen 10 percentage points from, uh, since 1990, from 86 to 76 percent. He said, uh, the number of people willing to describe themselves as atheist or agnostic has increased about fourfold from uh, 1990 to 2009, from about 1 million to about 3.6. If you don't understand what an agnostic is, this is an important term. So an atheist is a person that believes God does not exist or does, does, believes God does not exist. An agnostic is a person who believes we just can't know. So there's just no way to know whether God exists or not. That's what an agnostic is. He continues, the present in this sense, he says, is less about the death of God and more about the birth of many gods. Well, is this what we're seeing? Are we seeing a movement in this country towards kind of a polytheism or a, a kind of a view? Well, former president of, uh, of the United States, Barack Obama, said basically the same thing in his autobiography uh, called The Audacity of Hope. He says, Whatever we once were, we are no longer a Christian nation. We are also a Jewish nation, a Muslim nation, a Buddhist nation, a Hindu nation, and a nation of non-believers. Essentially, a nation of many gods is what he is claiming. However, this is simply not true. It is not true to say that we're becoming a nation of many gods. What is really happening is a shift towards no religion. It's a shift towards no religion. Although the majority of people in the country are Christian, a total of 68% according to a, a 2020 Gallup survey, what we are in fact are seeing is that the number of people that declare themselves to have no religion has increased from 1% in 1950 to 20% in 2020. From 1% in 1950 to 20% in 2020, that is a significant change in the, the, in the statistics. During that same time period, the number identified as other religions increased only from 
3% to 6%. Only change from 3% to 6%. The number of people who stated that religion is very important in their life declined by 10% from 1992 to uh, 2020. This is a war of worldviews between atheism and theism for the souls of humanity. Atheism, again, when applied, applied to the physical world, leads to what we call naturalism or materialism. The belief that all that exists is the material world. That everything came about through purely natural processes. Well, it's important to our understand what natural science is. And again, it is an adherence of all scientific inquiry to what we call philosophical naturalism. This is what they hold to, that everything came about through purely natural processes, that all physical phenomena must be explained as, as happening through purely natural processes. When this philosophical view was applied to the biological world, this is, what, this is where evolutionism ultimately came from. It is an attempt to explain how all life on earth came about through purely natural processes. Well, when this view about life was applied to humanity, this is where we ultimately got humanism humanism, which uh, is basically the view that we are independent of a creator God. This is what humanism is. It is not, though, just a worldview, but is the world's oldest religion, a religion that worships man, or in its moderate form, holds that man is just independent of his creator, of any God. It began with Adam and Eve as they ate the forbid forbidden fruit to receive the knowledge of good and evil. Following that simple act, humanity began to view itself as an autonomous, self-directed, godlike person. A person upholds humanism whenever they place their own views or opinions above the word of God. Have we ever been guilty of such a thing? Hmm. The Greek philosopher Protagoras uh, summed up the stance of humanism with his uh, maxim, man is the measure of all things. We decide for ourselves, see, what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. He held, he held that each man is the standard of what is true for himself and that all truth is relative to the individual, so we call moral relativism. What I think is good is not necessarily what you think is good. Both could be. Well, this is one of the tenets or doctrines of humanism, which are expressed in the Humanist Manifesto, which was first published in 1933, revised in 1971, and again in 2003. The tenets of uh, humanism include atheism, evolution, moral relativism, human autonomy from a creator God, and world government. If you find the latter a bit... Uh, a bit, uh, uh, you know, questionable. Go in and look it up yourself. I did. I, after reading a book or two on humanism, uh, from that were being, uh, books that were being taught in our school, I, I went and did some look into this myself and uh, found uh, the statements on the American Humanist Association website confirming it. Although atheists and secular humanists represent a very small portion of the population, they have exerted today a great influence over the culture through political involvement and through their interactions with media. From the What We Believe page of the American Humanist Association website, they say this, located in Washington, D.C., the American Humanist Association advocates progressive values and equality for humanists, atheists, free thinkers, and the non-religious. See, equality for non-religious, not religious. With our extensive local and national media context, our lobbying and coalition efforts on Capitol Hill, and the efforts of our grassroots, grassroots activists, we ensure that the humanist point of view is represented. The idea that you can be good without belief in God. You can be good without belief in God. Barack Obama identified himself as holding uh, to a secular humanist ideology in his autobiography, again quoted previously. He said, I was not raised in a religious household. Without the help of religious text or outside authorities, my mother worked mightily to instill in me the values that many Americans learn in Sunday school. Honesty, empathy, discipline, uh, delayed gratification, and hard work. A statement that was celebrated much by the American Humanist Association, who uh, uses the catchphrase motto again, good without God. But we're seeing a reality much different. People are not good without God. We are 
terribly sinful. Sin rolls out of us innately, instinctively. We lie at the slightest provocation, cheat, steal. We need the conviction that comes through the Holy Spirit to be good. And we can only be good with his help. In a society that views itself as just another animal and denies the existence of a lawgiver as the source of ultimate foundations of ethics, there inevitably will exist a, a society based on man's opinions rather than God's word, a society of lawlessness, a society that is acceptance of, acceptance of, of immoral behaviors like homosexuality, legalized abhorrent behaviors like abortion, well, whenever we consider the growth of those claiming to have no religion, it is clear that teachers are saying what itching ears want to hear. What is happening today was prophesied by Paul in his letter to Timothy. He said, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Well, this is a, the essence of secular ideology, such as a natural science. There's an abundance of evidence of design all around us, and yet they refuse to accept the witness of their own eyes and have turned aside to myths. Ladies and gentlemen, we are in a world, war of worldviews. The teachings of naturalism, evolution, are in direct conflict with the Bible's teachings. They are an impediment that keeps people from coming to the faith and the root cause of the loss of faith occurring today and particularly amongst young people. But sadly, many Christians do not understand that these teachings are in conflict. And the evolutionists understand this, though. That's why we see them displaying the ichthys, the Jesus fish, modified into an evolving fish on their cars. Well, in the minds of many, the, the main cause of the decline of belief that we're seeing today is unquestionably the pervasive teachings of evolution in our public schools, which is indoctrinating our youth towards an atheistic worldview. So, what happened? What happened? Well, once upon a time, the church was the center of, of our community and very involved in education and politics. Once upon a time, we were. Remember that 95% of the founding fathers of the U.S. were devoutly Christian. 100% had known Christian church affiliations. 27 of the 56 signers of the De Declaration of Independence had Christian seminary degrees. And the majority of the schools in America were originally founded by Christians. However, this is no longer the case. Why? Why has the church become uninvolved in education is unclear. But we have turned the education of our children over to the government. Very few churches today have a Christian school uh, that they have founded and or support. I think every church today should have a Christian school or be supporting the Christian school of another church. But we cannot put the blame of our youth walking away from their faith solely on the church. The parents are expecting the church to do their job of educating and discipling their children. They send them to the church to do their job. Nevertheless, there is a reason why the church is not involved in politics. There's a reason why we're not involved in politics any longer. We've been paid. We've been paid to stay out of politics. The payment has come in the form of what's called the 501c3 federal tax exemption for nonprofit organizations and charities which has since been used to prevent these groups and subsequently the church from uh, exercising their First Amendment rights. The first restriction was added in 1934 as a floor amendment, which imposed a lobbying restriction on charitable organizations, stating that no substantial part of an organization's activities constitute carrying on propaganda or otherwise attempting to influence legislation that can happen. So they put a restriction in place to prevent us from lobbying to affect legislature. But courts have uh, weighed in on this variously, very, at various times over the last few decades, and they've weighed in on about 15%. So in, uh, a 501c3's activities, up to 15% up to of their total activities can be lobbying to influence legislature. So the church or, or 501c3s can definitely be involved in lobbying activity to influence legislature. But I have seen churches that felt like it was they were violating the law just to have uh, um, petitions 
placed at the church. I've heard people mention that they thought churches were violating the law, just having petitions there, which is just not true. Further restrictions on campaign activity were added by uh, Congress in 1954. This amendment was introduced by Senator Lyndon Johnson in response to a nonprofit who was campaigning for his opponent. So he added this restriction. He also added churches to the Internal Revenue Service list of qualifying organizations for the first time, an action he called a favor to the church. However, prior to this amendment, the church was already exempted from paying tax, but was now subject to the restrictions of the tax code. The amendment was introduced uh, during a Senate floor debate on the Internal Revenue Service Code and the, prohibit, uh, the prohibition added to the code without hearings, testimony, or comment from any tax-exempt organization. In 1997, Congress again amended the language prohibiting statements from opposing candidates. So you can't campaign for, and now you campaign, can't campaign against a political official if you are a 501c3. However, churches don't have to be 501c3s. You don't have to take ex tax exem exemption status. You can just pay taxes like everyone else and get back involved in uh, political activity. It's a choice that we make to take that tax exemption and allow ourselves to be restricted in that way. Well, this is how, however, a direct violation of the First Amendment. Uh, uh, our, our constitutional protection uh, from the uh, freedom of religion and speech. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. But through these restrictions, they are now prohibiting certain kinds of speech that a pastor may say from the pulpit. And that is troubling. That is troubling. In closing, ladies and gentlemen, remember that Christ himself gave to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. And we were instructed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and all of our soul and with all of our mind and with all of our strength. If we compare, note, if we compare this command from Jesus with the original Deuteronomy, Jesus added with, all, with your mind to that. And it's clear we are told to be thinking scholarly disciples of Christ. To defend his word in the war of worldviews we find ourselves in today. Let me close down a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. That gives us such tremendous insight into this world. And Father, we need your Holy Spirit. We need the wisdom. We need the teaching that comes through your Holy Spirit, Father. We, uh, we need wisdom. We need wisdom to understand your word. We need wisdom to understand the science that's being used to attack your word. Give us wisdom, Lord. We ask for this. Pour your wisdom into us, Lord, we ask, through your Holy Spirit. Father God, we thank you for this wonderful world that you made. For the many blessings that you've poured into us through this wonderful world that you've made. Father, we praise you. We thank you for providing everything we need. This wonderful, wonderful place. These wonderful bodies, Father. Father God, but we realize that this world is, has been corrupted by sin and it has fallen and broken. And Father, we, uh, we ask for healing, Father, for the bodies that we have. For we know they are broken. And we ask for healing, Lord. Repair our genetic code, Lord. Heal our, our various tissues, our tendons, our, our nerves, and our muscles. Lord, we ask for healing to not while we sleep. Heal us, Lord, we ask, so that we may serve you. Pour your wisdom into us, Father. Heal our bodies and allow us to be a witness for you. Embolden us to speak words of truth when we're able. Help us to be bold, Father God. We want to, we want to serve you, Lord. Help us in that end. Father God, we praise you. We glorify and honor you. We thank you. Praise the Lord God for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.